Welcome to our class tonight on the book of Acts. We are in chapter 16 tonight. Uh, we'll pray and we'll dive into this. It's a shorter chapter, but there's a lot in it. Me and Scott were talking earlier. There's uh, several different parts in there uh, that are kind of interesting. So let's go to word of prayer and we'll begin our class. Father God, we thank you for the night. We thank you for everything you do for us. We thank you for the beautiful days you've given us lately with the weather. And I just pray we can be outside to enjoy that, to see your creation and how awesome you are. And, and God, I pray your spirit speaks through me tonight as we study this chapter of Acts. And help us dive into it to see how Paul is reacting to different circumstances he comes across. We thank you for everyone's here tonight. We thank you for the ones that are online and ones may view it later. We give you all the praise in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. I will start off right off the rip. There are some tough words in this chapter. Uh, the, ones I, the ones I have problems with, Scott has volunteered to say those for us. Uh, Emily can. I'm sorry if somebody can. Uh, I have used Google... Um, translate uh, this afternoon trying to figure out to make sure I can get those down and I probably will still butcher some of them so bear with me please uh, show some grace on those if you don't mind so what is the recap of Acts 15 we just finished it last week we were past the halfway point in the book of Acts there's 28 chapters what did we study last week on 15 and what is a how would you summarize chapter 16 if you guys have read it already well, 15, they had the Jerusalem Council. They were bickering and trying to figure out what to do with the Gentiles. Okay. Uh, 16 is Paul's secondary, second missionary trip. Okay. He connects up with Silas and uh, Timothy, and Luke joins the crowd. I thought Luke's been with them the whole time. He's writing this story. Nope. Okay. Right. Well, he connects up with them somewhere in here. Okay. We'll touch on that. I think it's, 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 it's very interesting where it changes and we see him actually join Yeah, in. he goes You're, from saying Paul to we, 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 yeah. we were doing stuff. Yeah, and at the end of the chapter we'll see he says they went. Right. So we'll, we'll cover that. Yeah, so I, you're right. It's very interesting. Yeah. Because we know he's writing this, so how is he getting this information if he's not been with them the whole time? And we'll talk a little bit about that tonight, so... Uh, I think that's a great recap from 15, a uh, great summarize of 16. Anybody else got anything for that? He get on a ship and go somewhere. I forget where it was, but there's also like a apparition of something that I really don't remember what it was, but okay. it has some significance. If it comes to you as we're going through, it's in chapter 16, I don't know. Uh, feel free uh, to do it, you know, share with us for sure. Uh, Barnabas and Mark go on a ship and go to Cyprus at the end of 15. Mm -hmm. uh, 60, 60 is where uh, Paul actually reached the other people. He reached and changed them, got them to come to God, but also God saved them because he had the earthquake and so on and got them out of the jail and so yep. they have been beaten. And, so. and, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll cover that as well. That's a highlight, one of the highlights of the chapter for sure. But they did uh, sail from, I can't, I, don't, I didn't bring my glasses with Oh, me. no. This is a place I couldn't pronounce. T, it starts with a T, and it's short. Troas. 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 Troas, and goes over to uh, something that starts with an N. <laughs> uh, Nepalis? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We'll, we'll get there. Yeah. So. That's in this chapter. It is. So let's get to uh, verse 1 through 5. And it says, Paul came to Derby and then to Lystra, where the disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was Jewish and a believer, but whose father was Greek. The believers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him along on the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in the area. For they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they traveled from town to town, they delivered the decisions preached by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. So Derby and Lystra were about 250 miles roughly west of Antioch. Remember, Antioch is a focus now. It's not Jerusalem anymore. It's Antioch going forward from 16. Uh, they're going by land currently. Mark and Barnabas were going by boat to Cyprus. 
So, who do they run into as soon as they get to Derby and then Lystra? And what do we know about this person? Who do they find? Timothy. Timothy is there. Okay. What, what do we know about Timothy? Uh, his mom's a Jew. His dad is a Greek. Okay. He's a good fellow. Good fellow. Okay. Does anybody else know anything about... And he's uncircumcised. Uncircumcised. More likely, he's fairly young. Probably a teenager. Okay? Somewhere in that, what we would view today as a teenager. Okay? Um, Paul mentions in... Well, he's a disciple whose mother's Jewish and dad's father's Greek. We read in 2 Timothy, Paul mentions how Timothy's grandmother and mother had faith that also lives in Timothy. Okay? Uh, 2 Timothy is written very late in Paul's life, probably the last letter he writes before he uh, is murdered. Uh, we see in Acts that he's spoken very well of among the people there. Uh, as we see Timothy grow over the next years, he becomes a huge, important person. Paul calls him his son, thinks very well of Timothy, puts him in charge of appointing elders in the in the area of Ephesus, leaves him there to do that. A very uh, serious job to do for, for that area. Um, plays a big role in the first century church. Uh, but he's taking he wants to take Timothy along. Why did Timothy want to go? Why did Paul want Timothy to go with him? What was the reason behind it? You think he had a great rep. He could put his in the south end of the river, in the end of the door. Okay. General faith. Uh, he was so he carry their supplies. <laughs> he is younger, so more than likely he does have a stronger back, maybe. Could be an extra person to help carry stuff. Absolutely. Um, he was respected among the fellow Christians. Um, and he knew scriptures uh, as well. Second Timothy 1 5, he was respected. Uh, and it's shown throughout. He, he knew the Old Testament scriptures because there is no New Testament currently. They're writing the New Testament stuff. Uh, it's a person that I think Paul thought he could train as a disciple. He could train him to become a missionary like himself. He had potential. And Paul saw it and wanted to take that and run with it. Which decrees were they delivering? And Scott touched on it earlier on his recap of 15. What decrees were Paul and Silas going to share throughout the churches they were going to? The decrees from Jerusalem? The, uh, the council. Of what the Gentiles had to do. What they agreed upon that the Gentiles had to follow. You mean you want to... No, we don't need the four. Okay. I mean, but I'm saying, but that's what they. If you if you want to nail them out, you can. Yeah, well, Go right ahead. Right. Uh, <laughs> abstain from eating food offered to idols, consuming blood or the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. Okay. So no circumcision. No. Okay. So why does Paul circumcise Timothy? Well, according to what my notes and my books say here. Um, to the Jews, a half-breed like a Samaritan. Uh, excuse me. Timothy was the son of a Jewish mother and Greek father. To the Jews, a half-breed like a Samaritan. So Paul asked Timothy to be circumcised to remove some of the stigma he may have had with Jewish believers. Timothy was not required to be circumcised, but he voluntarily did this to overcome any barriers to his witness for Christ. Absolutely, I, I think Just so people couldn't have a reason to mm -hmm. not believe him. Correct. His audience would expand tremendously. The Jews would be come in to hear him as well, as long as the, the Gentiles. He also, he also had a right. He, his mother was Jewish. Right. He had a right to be circumcised. Um, way older than what they, 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 they should have done. <laughs> really? Um, but... It opened the door for the Jews to respect him and be, able, and be willing to listen to him. Uh, he could draw a very much bigger crowd being circumcised. Uh, although Paul has mentioned he's the apostle to the Gentiles, as we see, mostly he goes to the Jews first 
then goes to the Gentiles. So if Timothy's going along with him, what's Timothy going to do? He's not going to be very helpful in that matter because he's not circumcised. That, that's my viewpoint from it. And I think, I think your notes are right on uh, as well, Scott. Let's read 6 through 10 real quick. Uh, Paul and his companions travel throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, have been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Nyssa, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, Come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Question there is, why did the... Why did who stopped him from preaching and who stopped him from going to Bithynia? The Spirit of Jesus. So why do you think he did that? That's a good question. We were talking about that a little earlier. He had a plan. God had a plan for them to go in a certain way. And we'll see a couple other incidents in Scripture that Paul has guided in a certain way by the Holy Spirit. Um if he had went that direction, could he have went to Macedonia at that time? You, you, I mean, that's a question to throw out there as well. Um, I, I think we need to... Paul listened and he was obedient to the Holy Spirit. He listened to him and followed it. And he also taught his companions as well to follow as well. Uh, Macedonia is north of Greece and Europe, across the Aegean Sea, and northwest of Troas, which is located on the northwestern coast of what is now Turkey today, and where Paul and his companions arrived. So, Emily touched on it earlier, I don't think in, uh, in class we were talking one-on-one. But who's the we in verse 10? Who? I'm sorry? Paul, Silas, and Luke. Okay. And Timothy. And Timothy. Timothy's there with him because he's taking Timothy along. So we got Luke, Paul, Silas, and Timothy. Totally spent Silas wrong. Not his name wrong. Ignore that. <laughs> um, typo. Yep. Um, most think this is where Luke joined him for the first time. Okay? This is the first time in Acts that we have the word we. Okay? More than likely, Luke joins them right here. So the question will occur, how did he get the last 15 chapters of information? Um, Paul and Silas. <laughs> well, who is Luke? What is, what is his profession? What has he done? Is he a doctor? He, he's a physician. He's also a historian. Yeah. So he's, through the Holy Spirit, he has gained this information in writing this. But now he's getting the first-hand account of Paul and what's going on. I think it's important to know that because when you read the, the book, we assume he's just going along with the ride. But he hasn't been... Pre- hasn't been we in a sense. Yes, yeah. So, well, and you got to figure, Paul is responsible for most of the New Testament. There are letters that he's writing. Correct. There's no way that he's the only person amongst this entire crew that is writing letters back and forth. See, you got to figure. I mean, Luke had to have some ideas of what was going on with these guys. I agree. And so did Peter and, and whoever else. You know, we only have this stuff, but I'm sure the gaps that are in this, they, they weren't just standing quietly in a corner. You know, I wouldn't they, think they so. Knew, <laughs> they knew what each other were up to and what was happening. Correct. So, and, and they shared it with each other, and, and, and word of mouth got around for sure. You know. Um, and, and Paul may have gave him the rundown. Hey, let me tell you what happened in the last roughly 12 years. Real quick. And you need to write this down real quick. Anyway, you know, I mean, who knows? I'm sure he had a conversation with him. But also word of mouth and, and definitely through the Holy Spirit. Uh, for sure. But this is probably the first place that he's joined them like in person. Okay? I think that's important. But we see it. We don't see this again in... We don't see the word we pop up again until chapter 20. So Luke is left in Philippi at the end of chapter 16 
And presumably he stays there. And we see him pick up again in chapter 20 when Paul's coming back through. So I think it's interesting to see that because we understand the books put together a little bit. Uh, let's read um, 11 through 15 real quick. From Troas, we put out to sea and sailed straight for Samothrace, and then the next day we went on to went on to Nepalus. From there, we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony and the living city of that district, of Macedonia. And we stayed there for several days. On the Sabbath, we went outside to the city gate to the river, where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the other members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she says, come stay at my house, and she persuaded us. Sam, how do you pronounce that word, Bob? We talked about this yesterday. Sam, uh, Samothrace. okay. It's a, has major volcano island, okay, about halfway between Troas and Nepalus. Only 11 miles long. Uh, it's very small but tall, over 5,000 feet. Uh, the ship carrying Paul, Silas, and Timothy and Luke ran straight course. We find that in Acts 16 11. Uh, most likely spent the night there. They went from there to Nepalus the next day. Uh, Nepalus was founded by Philip II, the king of Macedon, and the father of Alexander the Great. Philippi was the foremost city of eastern Macedonia which today straddles the northern Greece and the Republic of Macedonia further north. Uh, Nepalus was the port of Philippi, which is located eight miles inland and just north of the Ganges River. Food for thought, some information. I think I put that on your notes. If I did not, uh, forgive me. I did? Okay. I, this is also a tidbit of information of today, so you kind of get an idea of where we're at. Why would, prayer, well, why would prayer be customi- customary made at the riverside outside of Philippi? No synagogue. No preaching. Yeah. Okay. So there's very few Jews, very few Jews in, the, Jews in the city, so they went out to the riverbank to, to preach. Okay. Or pray, I'm sorry. Yeah, you're, yeah, you're, you're, you're right. It would take ten Jewish men required to establish a synagogue. Until ten Jewish men could gather in a town, the Jews gathered for prayer on the Sabbath under the open sky. Uh, Philippi likely had neither the required ten Jewish men nor a synagogue, so on the Sabbath day they went out uh, to the riverside, probably because it's cool, uh, with the breeze coming off of it, uh, and they prayed. Which shows you can pray anywhere as well. You don't have to be inside of a, a building just to pray. So what is it meant by a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira? And I, I give you the answer there anyway. So, well, and according to my notes, she would have she would have been pretty well off. Oh yeah, the purple color was. Yeah, she, she yeah. was she was not hurting for money. Uh, definitely not. Cloth was hard to come by. High up. <laughs> well, his royalty, you know, is what mm-hmm. you would have that if you're a royalty. It was really hard. Uh, extremely rare, and therefore very expensive. Uh, she probably was a very well-to-do merchant. Um, very well-to-do business, uh, because she knew uh, what it took to do it, and she had the, the gift and the ability to do it. But it took, some research I did, it took a quarter of a million of these shellfish to extract one ounce of purple dye. Okay. The color of royalty was extremely rare. We've already talked about that. So I think, I mean, that's a lot of shell, shellfish to get one ounce. And I don't know how much an ounce would do. Probably not a whole lot, potentially. And I say her her purple was very well made. She probably didn't skimp on the ounces of she used. But the amount it took was a crazy amount. So I, I think you're right. I mean, she, she was well off for sure. 
wasn't able, Lydia, to heed the things spoken by Paul. She was a God-fearing woman. Okay. He says the Lord opened her heart. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. God opened her heart to, to hear Paul's message. Is that still true today, you think? Does God still open people's hearts sure. to heal the message? We can plant seeds, but God's got to do, He's got to open the ground for them to hear. And you know, John 6 644 says, No one can come to the main, come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. God God's working. And we see it right here. Obviously, he opens her heart. And I think uh, it's important to realize that if we know somebody that is not saved currently today, pray to God, work on them, open their heart, help them see you. And for us to do our part as well in sharing the gospel. Paul shared it. God opened her heart. She believes Let's go 16, 18 real quick. If you guys have any other suggestions, by all means, speak up. Once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. She followed Paul and the rest of, the, the rest of us shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God. Who are you telling the who are telling the way to be saved? She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the Spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the Spirit left her. Kind of wild. Something I'm different. I'm just fascinated by the fact that it went on for days. Yeah. yeah. Like I was saying earlier, it, it's as if they see demon-possessed people here and there, and it's just no big deal. You know, yeah. There's just somebody else with a demon in them. The only reason that he drove the demon out is because the girl got on his nerves. Yeah. Yeah. So it leads me to believe that it was not uncommon for there to be demon-possessed people wherever they went. Well, let's back up 15 years, 18 years roughly, wherever we're at, to Jesus' time while he's on the earth. How many demon possessions do we see in the Gospels? Quite a few. Many. And John records in his gospel many more miracles were done. And if they were recorded, it would abound many books. So how many did how many demon possessions did Jesus cast out that's not recorded in Scripture? Right. Nothing in Scripture said, hey, when Jesus died and rose from the gra grave, that demon possession stopped. Still there. And nothing says it closed at the end of the Revelation book either. I think it's still today. Oh, for sure. Satan is still mighty powerful. And he can come inside of you and you don't even know it. You can watch the news for five minutes. Well, yeah. 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 Or, or you can read the uh, you know, the reports that we get from the, the jail of sure. who gets arrested and what they've done. And you're thinking, there's absolutely no way the man did it right mine. Could he be demon possessed? Sure. And I think a lot of times we throw that off, and I'm not downplaying mental health by any means, because I think that's an issue as well. Could they be demon possessed? Absolutely. I love what Sheriff Sexton said in an interview yesterday. They're talking about doing up, upgraded security for the Washington County schools. He said, "Guns doesn't kill. It's the evil heart, evil thoughts, and hardened heart is what kills." Absolutely. I said that man right there is not afraid to bowl. To he, he's sharing some gospel right there. Yeah, he was. And he's not, you know. So I think it's still happening today, 100 percent, without a doubt. Some translations has it as a spirit of divination. In the Greek, I'm not even trying to pronounce the Greek word because I can't pronounce some of the English words in this, in this chapter. Uh, but it means the spirit of the python. In the Greek paganism, python was said to be a serpent that lives in Delphi in what is the southern Greece today and was said to have the power of divination. A spirit of python is likely to have been what the locals called uh, the demon in this slave girl, potentially. I just think it's interesting. Um, can a demon or demonic spirit really have that type of power to tell the future? Because she didn't lie here. Apparently so. I, I, I think we need to. We always we automatically think. I think spiritual power is always evil. 
Which it is, but it's not lying. It's not lying. And, and, and she said, these men are the servants of the Most High God. Not just a God. Not just an idol. The Most High God. Do you realize all of us in here are children of the Most High God? We need to remember that. You have all these other little gods, and if you read through Scripture, you'll see evidence of that. Idols and different things, and especially through the Old Testament, there's nothing that says they're not there now. But we are children of the Most High God, Yahweh. And our God is at the top. Um, Satan has a demonic power for sure. And he's a fallen angel. He's a creature whose spiritual power uh, prowls on people, I think. Uh, we need to be careful with that. Remember uh, to test whatever we're, we're doing against Scripture, against the Spirit, for sure. But I believe, obviously, we see it in Scripture, it can have that type of power. You know, my Bible says what they had and they worshipped was with a python. Well, yeah, that's all I got to be saying, yeah. Uh, the spirit of the python, which was a, a snake that is, like, enormous. I mean, you know, uh, I can't remember what that movie was back in the 90s, um, Anaconda. Mm -hmm. I don't know what type of, I guess that was an Anaconda snake, but if, if, if a python's anywhere size of that, I don't deal with snakes, period. They're getting cut up. They're like the poison ivy you're dealing with. We're going to set fire to it. Mm -hmm. We're going to burn it. Uh, I don't like snakes, period. I just, I just, that's not me. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, don't call me for a snake removal. But those idols around the world, that they, people worship them and, and don't worship God. That's what you call the split in between God and, and, and the rest of the world. So yeah, absolutely. And, you know, some uh, cultural still worships those idols. And, you know, that's why it's so important to share the gospel, not just locally, but around the world. And, you know, we have some missionaries that go into areas that are... In that, in that predicament right now, uh, you know, we need to be in prayer for those as well because they are as lost as this and people we may know locally that are lost. But they're worshiping, they're worshiping something other than the Most High God. That was, I've heard that story. That's a wild story. <laughs> um, so what did the slave girl possess with the spirit of divination cry out? And we've kind of already touched on it. Just confirming that they are who they say they are. They are who they say they are, and they... They're telling you how to be saved. Yep. And and she's correct. She's not She's not fibbing. She's telling the truth. Then why did Paul get annoyed with her if she said the truth? He, I mean... He didn't want to be associated with... Demonic. Demonic. Well, I think I think you're right. I, I think I think that's part of it. I think if they knew she was crazy and possessed. They weren't going to believe what he what he was saying. Exactly. She had that she had that reputation in that area already. I, th I think there's at least three reasons. I think there's I think that's one. Um, she kept repeating this for many days. Okay. So he was literally annoyed. Yeah, it's almost like a teenager is going, hey, can I go out to the movies tonight? Maybe. Yeah, and you don't go? No. Okay, can I go tomorrow? Maybe. My aunt used to tell me maybe all the time. And then like the third or fourth day, you get tired of it. What do you normally say? No. Well, sometimes they say yes. <laughs> they just want you to quit. They want, they want you to it's not be asked awkward. anymore. Yeah, yeah. Are we there yet? Yeah, of course. Yes, we are. We are there. Um, second, remember, they're at a prayer meeting. They're praying. They're going to go pray. She's crying out during a prayer, saying this, chanting this. Okay? I think that's disrupting the prayer time. And what Scott said last, her reputation, I think Deb touched on it as well, they could maybe, people might think, well, hey, they're trusting her, so the reputation could go down considerably. Don't that, I will not change it. But you know, I was talking, we were talking earlier, there's really no difference in today's time of psychics. 
and fortune tellers. We have that today. On Oakland Avenue, I drive by one at least twice a week. You know, and normally there's at least one or two cars in the parking lot there. And, and there's, the Bible is very clear, Scripture is very clear to stay away from them. Sure. And, you know, we are seeking advice from everywhere. Most sometimes, and I, I'm guilty for not seeking Scripture advice sometimes when I deal with things. Never went to a psychic or fortune teller. But we seek advice from everywhere but God sometimes. Or we wait to the very last minute, everything else has failed. The fortune teller has said, hey, you're going to do this, and it doesn't happen. And I said, well, hey, God, you know, you got an answer. Yeah, I do. And I can save you so much time if you just ask me first. And, and I'm guilty for it because sometimes I don't. And I think that's something that we all need to practice of seeking God's advice first in the minor things and in the major things. And I think if we would do that, our lives would be a little different. But then when we seek it, we've got to listen. Then we've got to put it into play. It's just not him telling us and us just not doing anything with it. So, are you good? Are you good, Emily? Okay. Everybody good? Okay. Let's go to 19 through 28. When the owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, the owners of the slave girls, who is who's is who's is who those are, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged him into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, These men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating custom, un, customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in, in the inner cell and fastened their feet in stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open, and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he had thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, Don't harm yourself. We are all here. Is that pretty wild or what? So, during this whole incidents of them being arrested and seized and beaten because of some, I think, obviously based on Scripture, false out, false accusement. Who wasn't seized? Timothy and Lydia. 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 Well, Lydia's not with them. Lydia's still back where she's at. She, she didn't travel with them. It doesn't say in Scripture she traveled. So Timothy and Luke were not seized. Why? Anybody got an answer for that? Timothy's half free. Okay. Okay. So that could be part of it. Okay. It says they were there around them. Paul and Silas are probably the primary speakers. Yeah. Yep. Definitely Paul. He he's full throttle talking. I, I think I think Bob's correct, obviously, that Paul and Silas are the main speakers. I think you touched on something, Emily, that Timothy's part Greek. So they may not have thought they, they were with them as a Partners, Luke is Greek as well. Is he? Yes, he is. He he, he is Greek. So is Paul, but they didn't seem to recognize well, that very early. <laughs> well, Paul Paul's a Roman citizen. He, he's Jewish. He's not Greek. That's right. Um, so I think Bob's right. Paul and and Silas too, but Paul is the main spokesperson, and I'm sure Silas is being supportive. He's come. I mean, he's been with him for a while. Let's, let's support him, and he gets himself uh, caught up in a big mess. <laughs> so, uh, one commentary I read it said Timothy may have been looked too young to be considered a man in this. Could be. Um, scripture doesn't say they did not get seized. So, what errors are found in, in the accusement of against Paul and Silas? They're accused of some things in here that did not happen as the story unfolded. Hmm. I 
fear of causing the uproar. Correct. Yeah. They didn't cause any trouble. They didn't teach customers that were not not lawful. And they both were Roman citizens. Well, they may have taught some unlawful things because they're teaching don't worship Caesar. Well, true. Don't go to the temple, don't pay the temple tax, and that kind of stuff. So they might have been teaching things that the Roman government required, which was Caesar worship. That, that is true. Okay. But share, I was thinking of sharing Jesus. In a sense, that would have been unlawful. But yet, if they're sharing the temple taxes of that, for sure, yes. That would have been what they should have done. I think because they were Roman citizens, they didn't go in front of a, a proper court to uh, evaluate your crime. Yep. Yeah. You're, you're right, because we'll see that a little bit later. Paul says, hey, you need to come walk us out. And that would show that what they did was wrong. So, so they get arrested, and what happens? And, and, and what should have happened, I guess, is a better question. Um, we'll go back to that in a second. What should have really happened when they when they came out? What should the Madras done instead of what they did do? They should have had trial first. Trial. Okay. Yeah. Beat them first. Yes. So they should have looked for some evidence based on what they're accused of. And then give the, uh, the opportunity to, def to present a defense and did a trial. But they went with the, the mob and skipped to directing punishment and executing it. They didn't do it, they didn't handle it correctly. So how did they, how did Paul and Silas handle being falsely accused and beaten and jailed. They sang songs. Yeah. Praising God. They were having a good time. Oh, yeah. I mean, and you thinking, they probably knew how to beat someone pretty well. Well, but Paul already on his first missionary trip got killed and thrown outside the gate. So, well, yeah, he got he got hit pretty hard. Yeah, yeah he was probably saying, "Man, hey, cool, they didn't kill me this time." Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. It was no big deal to him, I'm sure. Yeah, but Silas, he just joined in with these. Sure. And he's like, "What you got me into here?" Mm -hmm. I mean, potentially. But Jesus says, "Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for their kingdom is, uh, is the kingdom of heaven." And I think we need to remember that. They're being persecuted for righteousness. But they're praying and praising God and singing hymns and, and, and why they're bound to the to the floor and, and, and shackles. And I just It does not give the impression that they are under any sort of stress whatsoever. No. Yeah, I, they're praying and singing and just having a big time yeah. after being beaten up and chained to a wall. So. Yeah. It's like, it's like an average Tuesday for them. Sure. I sure. mean, you know, hey, it's the night time, we're gonna do this. And I'm thinking, man. You know, Stephanie and I were talking about that's God picks people for specific things because he knows that they can handle yeah. things. Obviously, Paul, I mean, this is not the last time he's oh, going to have some problems. Definitely not. You know, he and he just keeps keeps on going. He keeps trucking. Absolutely. He doesn't give up. And, you know, even being persecuted uh, and beat, he's still... He's still in there. And, and I think Silas is doing the same thing. He is singing hymns. He's singing. He's praising and praying. He's a strong individual himself. Uh, this is probably the first time that he's potentially been beat in, in according to Scripture. Right. So he's... Back in my head, I'll be thinking, man, what have you got me into here? I mean, you know, this was, a, this was what I think I was going to you know, do here. I, you know. But they obviously had a lot of faith. Absolutely. You know, because it, it didn't seem like they were very troubled over any of this at all. No. I mean... They're singing and praying. Yeah. It they, doesn't sound like they're very worried about anything. And it doesn't show any type of um, pushback. Sure. You know, they just took it, in a sense. Uh, how, are, how do you react when you're treated or teased or mocked, insulted, persecuted for Christ? And you may have not experienced that yet. You may have, you may never experience it potentially. 
you know, sometimes we have friends that disown us because we're a Christian. You know, sometimes we uh, lose family members because we accepted Christ. And it, it, I feel sorry for people. Yeah. Because, it, you know, they, they don't know any better. It, it's, a, it's a bad path yeah. to walk without God in your life. Yeah. So I, I feel sorry for them. I, yeah. I mean, I, I do as well. And, and, and the ones that get mocked and teased and disowned, it has to hurt them. Because they care for that person, obviously. They have a relationship, or they had a relationship with that person. And, you know, it, it can hurt. Uh, I, I think you've got to be like Paul and continue on. Don't say, if you're going to disown me, I'm going to, I'm going to disown Christ. You, you can't do that. Well, we see them in prison. We see the prison locked down. And we see them singing praises and hymns and praying. And then there's this enormous, huge earthquake. A violent earthquake, as it's described. And the doors fly open and the chains fall off. I often think, what would Washington County Detention Center do if that happened over there? <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, what, what would uh, happen to that? Uh, and what was the real reason for Paul and Silas getting dragged into the marketplace? I mean, let's cut the smoke screen in half here. Let, what was the real reason? That they got drugged into the market. Well, that space. little girl was making her uh, owner, owner owner a bunch of money. Yeah. And he was mad. Yeah, because he was so angry that their hope of profit was gone. It's what it says. Not that they caused an uproar. And I, I greed, <laughs> greed, hundred percent. He was worried about his profit was gone. Uh, they get put in prison. Earthquake happens. Uh, the prison guard freaks out, about ready to kill himself, and which answers that question. He tries. The prison guard tries to kill himself, and I think we need to realize in today's world, if we lose a prisoner, they're not going to kill you, uh, but they're probably going to investigate, and you're probably going to get in some serious trouble. I would like to point out something here. Go ahead. It says uh, the jailer woke up to see the prison doors wide open. He assumed the prisoners had escaped, so he drew his sword to kill himself. Yeah. Paul shouted to him, stop, don't kill yourself, we are all here. The jailer called for lights and ran, so yeah. it was dark and Paul stopped him from killing himself. I, I just, yeah. I, I thought that was a neat little tidbit well, that if he can't see Paul, how could Paul see him and stop him from what he was doing? Yeah. Because obviously he needed some light to get down there to find these guys. I just thought it was interesting that Paul stopped him and apparently it's pitch dark and he couldn't even see it. I've got that in the next question. Oh, okay. um, he witnessed three miracles that the prison guard did. He tries to kill himself. Paul stops him. Uh, you know, losing a prisoner in that time period, capital crime, you're done. Okay? You're, you're going you're gonna to be killed. Uh, he probably thought he was good as dead because assuming the doors are open, <coughs> hey, we're running free. We're, we're, we're out, okay? Um, you know, that's why so many people, I think, in this world today are against an inmate crew coming out and doing something because they're in an orange jumpsuit or whatever. Those guys are just no longer, nothing different than us. They're very respectful, and they're out here openly free doing stuff in our yard before from time to time. Do they like to want Poison ivy, you think? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I'll be happy to ask for you. Uh, you can see him taking it back from the I'm still thinking set fire to it. Bob's got the gas and we got the match. Let's do it. Uh, but the officers that are out here with them, they're not concerned with them running away. They trust them to a point. Obviously, you can't put so much trust in them that you become vulnerable. But they're not super worried that they're going to run. You know what I mean? Uh, they're in the building. They have some freedom to go to the bathroom and stuff. So I, this office, this guard ultimately thought, hey, I'm done. I'm dead because everybody's gone. So why did he walk, Why did he run and fall down trembling before Paul and Silas? Because they didn't leave when they could have. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. He, grateful. Grateful, yeah. He, he witnessed three miracles. At, at least three, okay? One, all the doors were opened. 
How's that possible? At the same time. At the same time. All the doors flew open. Okay? The second one is, none of the prisoners had left and his life had been spared. Okay? If only one had left, he would have been, he, he would have been murdered, uh, no doubt. And what Scott just touched on was, Paul had seen him through the darkness trying to kill himself before the jailer called for the light to be turned on, or for the light to come on. Paul saw him, and it's probably, we know it's late in the night, probably pitch black. Probably can't see your hand from your face type dark. Sure. And Paul sees him doing it, and tells him, saves him, from killing himself. How important do you think that is right now of Paul stopping him from killing himself? How important is it? I, I wondered about the, you know, this guy gets baptized. Mm -hmm. How many more people does he spread the word to? Correct. You know? Yeah. But what? Take it. Take an example and go out here with me on a little bit of a limb here. Say he doesn't. Say Paul doesn't stop him from killing himself right here. Say the guy kills himself. What happens to him? To Paul? No, to the jailer. Why was to the jailer? Well, he's definitely not going to the kingdom of God. Well, there's only two options. Sure. Where's the other option? Pretty hot down there. It's hot. It, he's, he's, he's destined to hell because he does not believe here. Paul not only saved his physical life, but also saved his spiritual life. But as we see here in a few, few verses, he comes to believe. And not only he comes to believe, but his whole household. I think it's important to look at that. Paul's action saved him spiritually and physically. Our actions today can save people not only physically but also spiritually. I think it's, I think it's important to look at that. I, you know, I, I assume that this is the Holy Spirit working through him because, you know, a few lines before, they are... They're swerved away from going yes. to a couple different places. So, yep. you know, obviously the Spirit is very much with them. Oh, absolutely. Which probably explains why Paul got killed, thrown outside of a gate of a, you know, and just got up walked back into the town. Yeah. You know, the, the Holy Spirit is most definitely with them, um, manipulating what they're doing, where they're going, and in this case, keeping this guy from dying. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And Paul's obedient to the Spirit. And I think that's something we can learn. If we learn anything from Paul, he's obedient. He follows the Holy Spirit as he leads him. And he talks when he needs to talk, and he's quiet when he's quiet. And as you go through the rest of the book, he approaches people and does it in a way that's just amazing to get them to understand who God is. He doesn't come out with the Bible that he's writing, the New Testament, and just beats them on the head. He gets on their level and shares the gospel. I think it's important. We can learn, we can learn a lot from Paul, uh, for sure. Um, so what would you expect the, the, the jailer to do at this point? I mean, what would, what would you think the jailer should have done? Knock them all back up. Yeah. yeah. Hey, thank you for not running. I have no idea what happened here. But thank you, and I'm going to put you back in your yeah, stocks. Yeah, go back in there. Yeah, go well, back another in. Another thing that, that, you know, it says there was an earthquake. Yeah. Apparently only at the jail. Yeah. 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 I mean, <laughs> yeah. So. Well, it's not like the people from the town were running out. Yeah. The no one no didn't collapse into a, in a, a crevice. It was only at just the jail. So yeah. the only people that were aware of what was going on was. At the jail. At the jail. And no one, it, there's no reference of scripture, nobody running to the jail to double check. Hey, are you guys okay? So, I think you're right. So, this is one of these miracles that necessarily isn't supernatural, but God uses a natural cause to show a miracle. Earthquakes are not supernatural. Right. So, you know... The earthquake confined to one building... Oh, it could be. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that right there, that part is... spread out quite a bit. Yeah, I mean, that part, would, I would agree, is supernatural to be on that one location. But the earthquake itself, we have them all the time in East Tennessee. We just don't know it. Sure. Uh, all right, let's push through this, if you don't mind. Uh, but I think Paul would have said, thank you for not uh, running away, and let's get back in there. And he was fortunate his own life was spared. Uh, let's read 29 through 34. 
Uh, then, then the jailer called for the lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul, Silas. He brought them out and asked him, Sir, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all of his households were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole, his whole household. This is an example of two different things. One, we can read verse 31 and say, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. So, here's prisoners and the jailer takes them to his house. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. He trusts them. Because even, as you read, as we get a little bit over, if you go to the next thing, they're back in the jail. Right. So, he takes them home with him, trusting that they're not going to run away. Okay? Feeds them. Cares for them. Cares for them. Yeah. And asks us the most important question anybody can ever ask. What must I do to be saved? And Paul tells them, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. So, we can take that verse, stop, okay, you just got to believe. Okay? And I think some people may do that. We go down a couple more verses, and his whole household was baptized. Somewhere in that conversation they were teaching about the Lord, Paul mentioned, hey, by the way, you need to be baptized. Don't let anybody take this verse and say, we just got to believe in the Lord Jesus, you don't have to get baptized. Because he is baptized. How would he have known that if Paul had not told him? He had to tell him. I mean, this is, there's just no way. Or Silas told him, someone told him. So why is the jailer filled with, uh, with joy? He heard the word of God. He became a Christian. He believed. Do you have joy today by being a child of God? I mean, I'm serious. I mean, you know, we need to have that joy in us, and it should be spreading. It should be so. We should be so full of joy, it's spreading out of us uh, and to other people. Um, Debbie kind of touched on it. They brought the jail. They brought the inmates out, and he took them to his home, um, and fed them, and, and take, uh, took care of them for that evening. And he brings them back, as we'll see later in the verse here coming up. Uh, he had a meal with them. He was friends with them in a sense, and I think that's something important to look at. Um, you could also read into that passage as well. So his whole household got baptized, and some people may take that. Example and say, okay, so we can baptize babies. We can baptize infants or two year olds. The Bible doesn't say how old they were. So that argument is cut down. It doesn't say they were infants or babies. It's just his whole household. No idea how old they are. I would presume they're probably of age because Paul probably wouldn't have baptized them if they were not of age. Notice verse 32. That they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. Yes. You wouldn't be speaking the word of the Lord to a two year old. Correct. They, they couldn't retain it, yeah. they wouldn't understand it. So, yeah. So, I mean, I think that's another evidence. You can't let somebody come tell you, well, we can baptize babies because of Acts chapter 16, verse uh, 31 through uh, 34. Uh, that's just not the case. I mean, he took a judge to his house, had a meal with them. His whole family came to believe. Um, what are you willing to risk to share the gospel with family and friends? This jailer took him into his home. Paul shared the gospel. If one of those people had escaped, his life would have been done. He trusted them. He took an, he took a chance. And I think by them not running at the initial time, probably proved, hey, they're not going anywhere. So, let's finish this out real quick if we can. I don't have, okay, there it is. Uh, when it was daylight, we're picking up in verse 35, we'll go through 40. Uh, when it was daylight, the master sent their officers to the jail, to the, jail, to the jailer, with the order, release those men. The jailer told Paul, the masters have ordered that you and Silas be released. Now you can leave. Go in peace. But Paul said to the officers, they beat us publicly without a trial, even though we are Roman citizens, 
and threw us into, a, into prison. And now, do they not, they, they want to get rid of us quietly? No! Let them come themselves and escort us out. The officer reported this to the magistrates, and when they had heard that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, they were alarmed. You better believe they were. They came to appease them and escort them from the prison, requesting them to leave the city. After Paul and Silas came out of this prison, they went to Lydia's house, where they met with the brothers and sisters and encouraged them. Then they left. I would suspect they were a little worried, a little scared. It says they were uh, alarmed. Why were they alarmed, do you think? Well, they got scared when they found out that they were Roman citizens. But before that, it doesn't say why they, they didn't know yet that they were Roman citizens. Correct. So I assume that this earthquake and all this ruckus Somebody must have told them what was going on, and they must have realized that they were dealing with some people that actually... Well, well, Paul tells them, they beat us publicly without a trial, and even though we are Roman citizens, they threw us into prison. So Paul's telling them, hey, I'm a Roman citizen, and what you did was wrong and it's illegal. Uh, why don't you come back and escort me out? Um, because, well, let's make a statement here. Okay? That's Paul being Paul. Uh, yeah, and apparently they didn't check the ID when they arrested him. <laughs> I mean, they didn't pull his wallet out and say, uh, where are you from? Um, so they had broke Roman law. It was illegal to, to beat or bind a Roman citizen for any reason, yet had been done both and without a trial or conviction. They just did it. Because, again, that mob was so powerful, probably, they, didn't have much, they probably didn't want to try to push back on it. Well, it's just like nowadays, if somebody disagrees with you, you get the mob mentality, people are fearful. Absolutely. So, yeah. They're gone. Yeah. So, did, did, Paul, did Paul refuse to leave quietly out of pride, you think? Why did he, why did he do that? He could easily say, I mean, I, if I was Silas, I thought, hey, Paul, let's just go, okay? <laughs> let's get out of here. Maybe I, keep other people having the same problem. You teach these magistrates, you can't just go around beating people without knowing who they are. Yep. Yep. If they, if they had not done this, the people in Philippi, the Philippians, could have concluded their their punishment was justified. And which would have invited more mob violence, potentially, against the church that was gathering by the riverside. Um, Paul wanted them to personally escort him out of the prison, not only so that they, the magistrates, will be careful in dealing with Christians in the future, but also for the bystanders to spread the word that by personally escorting Paul and Silas out of the prison, have publicly admitted to making an error against Christians. Yes. yes. Yeah. And I think it's important to realize that. He's trying to make a point not for himself. He's trying to protect the church in that area. And by doing that, it would show that that they were wrong. Uh, they're actually the area, but they don't immediately. They go to Lydia's house and encourage the ones that are there. Uh, then they leave. Uh, it seems to read that Luke stays there in Philippi. It says they left. Uh, so I would presume that Luke is staying there in Philippi. We'll pick up, in, when we get to chapter 20, we see Luke uh, we see Paul meeting up with Luke again because we had the word we come back in that we mentioned earlier. Uh, and so they left with Ben, Timothy, Silas, and Paul leave together. Uh, we see in verse 17, uh, verse 11, I think, of chapter 17, Paul leaves Timothy and Bria. Uh, Paul is on the move. He's sharing the gospel and not letting anything stop him, as Scott said, mentioned earlier. Oh, it's good from here. Nobody throws nothing at him. Or oh, yeah, it's, him. It's, it's a bed of roses, it's correct? Sales. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, I, think, I, think it the, gets worse. I think you might, read, might need to reread some. <laughs> it, gets a little, it gets a little testy again. So, anybody have any questions on, on chapter uh, 16? It's an it's a interesting chapter. It's got a lot in it. I was kind of concerned we wouldn't get through it, but we got through it, so thank you for your assistance with that. Anybody have any prayer requests? I'll just pray for these kids and teachers. Yeah.
don't know how you guys are doing it. One of our kids that go here has been very emotional about TCAPs because it's so it's been so stressful on them. So. And wow. Yeah. It's so much pressure put on them and on the teachers. I, you know, is this? I remember when I took them. It's been like you know, 25 years ago, I guess, or whatever. Huh? I wasn't. That, I don't remember being that stressed. I remember I had extra two, number two pencils on my desk, but that's about it. And erasers, but I didn't get the snacks and stuff they're doing now, which is great. I'm glad they're doing them. But you know, some of them are all computer. Oh, are they? Oh, wow! I did, did not know that. For the upper grades. Okay. Fifth and under are still doing paper. Really? Yeah. Wow. But next year they'll go to computers. Mm. See, back when Bob went to school, he had a hammer. <laughs> <laughs> and there were only three questions. But you didn't have to know much. No. Oh, okay. All right. I, I echo your... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Alley-oop, oop. Yeah. What happened if your chisel got dull? What would you do then? You get another one. You get another one. Okay. All right. Teacher, I'll... my chisel's yeah. broken. Can, can you sharpen that for me, please? And there's no eraser on the chisel. Right? No. Yeah. So you have to get a new tablet, I guess, right? Yeah. Okay. okay. Manual plumbing school. Those ladies up there. Like an average here. So. How much snow was there? Maybe four feet. One day. Four feet. Wow. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uphill both ways, correct? Yeah. That's it. Nothing comes to me. Well, let's pray, and uh, the tea caps go on. Uh, is that all through our next week too, Stephanie? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, let's just not stop praying tonight for them. Pray daily for them if, if we if we can, and and the teachers and the administration as well, because and the parents, the parents are are seeing the repercussion of tea caps, and it's it's it's, it's got to be sad. So, yeah, let's pray. Father God, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for. Uh, your word and, and preserving it through uh, generation after generation, centuries after centuries. And and God, I thank you for Paul and his boldness. Uh, I, I, I pray we can learn something from him. Uh, may it be keeping our faith, being bold, uh, sharing the, sharing Jesus. I, I just pray we can learn something from him and, and from your word. and uh, Protect us as we go about the evening. Protect us as we go home. Uh, I just pray that we'll continue to to be in your word daily. And God, I, I, I come to you tonight asking prayers for the teachers. Uh, I'm assuming this is statewide, but especially for the teachers in Washington County and Johnson City and the surrounding areas that are doing TCAPs right now. God, this, this test, the this standardized testing, is, is so hard on everyone. Just not the teachers, not the kids, but it's also hard on the parents. And God, I just pray that you would give them peace. Give them strength each day to complete their tests that they need to do. Give the teachers strength to, to administer the tests. Uh, give them an opportunity to relax and uh, take a breath. And, and I pray as the kids go home each day that they're not so upset that they just bawl and cry and, and, and just go to bed so early. But I pray they can be a, be a child. Um, God, help us help them in whatever way we can. Uh, help us remember to lift them up in prayer this coming week and next week. And, uh, we give you all the praise for everything you do. We thank you for your son. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody.